kid. Seriously. Welcome to the hardworking version of the Kid Seriously Show. This is the only podcast around where we dump the puck and chase it down. Grinding, grinding, always grinding. Every so often we get together to discuss news in the realm of Star Wars and other parts of the world that tickle our fancy, answer some questions that Kid Seriously got, and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. To my right, way to my right, out on the sunny coast, soon to be the rainy woods of Portland, it's the Darby Hendrickson of the Kid Seriously Show. It's Mark Neitzel, and to my left, it's everyone's favorite, some might say... The Wah himself. You son of a bitch. It's Luke Neitzel. Gentlemen, tell the world, how are you? Yeah, my least favorite athlete of all time. And I had a really good joke lined up when you called Mark Darby Hendrickson about how that means he must have banged around sister. And you've ruined it by making me compared to the worst person ever that played sports. If if you are the Wah, and if, if Mark was the Darby Hendrickson, who would I be? Uh, this is what I couldn't think of. Oh, that. who? yeah, who would you be? I want to be Sutton, but I don't think that's where you're going to go with this. Andy Sutton, wow, that's a name we haven't heard for a long time. You would be uh, Maxim Shushinsky, who oh, had a couple good games on the initial wild team and then brought his crying wife into the GM's Are office. Are you talking my crap about my wife? And asked to be sent, gonna end you, little sent man. back to Russia <laughs> because he didn't want to be here anymore. So, Are you saying I'm trying to negotiate my way out? Yes, you're seriously? always trying to, to break your contract and... Luckily, that shit's binding. So Unfortunately, yeah. Stuck I'm here. Due for seven years. Mm-hmm. Wow. None of that made any sense to me whatsoever. Yay, hockey. But care. I'm Portland Mark. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Right. I'm moving to Portland. And, and we just got our notice that we are going to be getting timber season tickets. So we get to go online and pick where in the stadium we're going to be sitting. I'm very excited. I've also been watching a lot of Rick and Morty lately, so Portland Mark. <laughs> oh, see, and you didn't even giggle when I did my Michael Don your on the episode where it was the two of us, and I was severely disappointed. But the what and the what now? What in a world where there are eight Jan Michael Vincents? Come on. Oh. Yes. Anyways, I feel like I feel we, like half of the show is you talking to Mark. And the other half is me talking to you. But and it's you gotta think about it this way. This is why you are the linchpin of kids seriously. Because mm-hmm. if it was just Mark and I, it would be us agreeing while making multiple statements that make no sense to anyone else because they're just us quoting dumb shows that we watched as children. Yeah. So without you, this show does not remotely work. It would be like watching two two year old twins who have their own made up language talking to each other. You know, they would be having a lot of fun, and it would be amusing to, to watch them giggle and, and talk, but you would have no idea what's going on. Yeah. Wow, you guys just summed up exactly how I feel every time we sit down to record. News! Nice! <laughs> guys, we're in a deep valley of despair and emptiness, this far out from the Star Wars movie, the next one that's coming in. No, Luke says he wants anticipation. But if the lights here at Camrose are going to keep staying on, I feel like we're going to need some real news soon. After 40 hard-fought seconds of searching, I did find out something interesting. It's not actually news, but it was better than talking about the San Jose earthquakes. According Oof, to the website, anything better than that. According to uh, the website, we've got this covered. Some Reddit user came up with them some interesting analyses about why <laughs> we need to start every segment with some Reddit user came up with. Oh, Some interesting analyses genius. about why o- Obi Wan Kenobi aged so quickly on Tatooine. One what, theory was it, was it user Jabba's boobs six <laughs> line. No. One theory is that the stress of the war aged him, while another is that he was constantly forced to use the Force to shield Luke from the Emperor and Vader. I always just chalked it up to that desert living. In any event, this article got me thinking about other things that should bother me about Star Wars, but don't. For instance, I don't care that Rogue One essentially made Saw Gerrera uh, the would-be leader of the Taliban, Osama Bin Laden, or that the Rebellion were a bunch of quitting whiners. I don't care that Anakin is essentially the Antichrist with no father and born from the Force. I don't care that the Emperor's face got jacked up from lightning instead of just being old. There are a ton of little things that could piss us off about the Star Wars universe. Which ones bother you, and which ones don't? 
I'm not sure how many of them do bother me. We kind of talked about it in the last episode when we talked about all the dumb shit that happens in space that's impossible, like fire and, you know, explosions and noise and how, like, a ship will blow up and suddenly it'll, like, crash down in space when it should just float away. And Mark was very upset about braids not flowing the right way when you're upside down and, and all those things. But I, I think it's, for the most part, it's stuff you just put behind you. It, there, there aren't logic flaws and things like that that are what ruin this. And what I'm about to say is so original that it's going to blow you both away. It's the the prequel shit Padme dialogue with Anakin. Like, I, I don't have time to get worried about there not really being fire in space when he's given a monologue about sand. Like, that's <laughs> that's the type of stuff we need to be avoiding and, and not dealing with, not, not logic flaws in that. So that stuff has never bothered me. It's a magical world, so why not have you know, stuff like that that maybe doesn't make sense. I mean, let's let's honestly talk about it being a magical world as much as people want to say it's science-based or whatever, but one of the biggest complaints about the Phantom Metis is the fact that midichlorians existed at all, right? That they gave a scientific explanation for what the Force is instead of just being magic. So let's, let's not dwell too much on that thing when we could be talking about, you know, ponytail braids and, you know, other horrible dumb shit that that happens in there i actually you know for the most part okay the the fact that you know you can hear tide fighters screaming even though there's no sound in space or the fact that everybody is always facing the same side up when they meet in battle you know i think those all those things those are kind of fun to nitpick at but i don't really care about them in the long run there actually is one thing though that has always really bothered me. Uh, at the end of Revenge of the Sith, J. Smith takes C-3PO, a droid that has been built by the number two in command of the Empire, a droid that has been there through <laughs> most know. of his life and has been a first-hand witness to all of the goings-on, who is one of, if not the single biggest source of intelligence on the biggest enemy to the Republic. What do we do with him? Oh, well, let's mind-wipe him so that we can um, explain away why he doesn't happen to know who Darth Vader is in the following three episodes. And, and that actually led me to something that actually is something that really annoyed me and pissed me off about the prequels, is... The whole concept of Anakin building C-3PO. Like, your mom is a slave, and you're building her a droid that can speak a million languages? Like, why don't you build something that kills slave owners, or finds her tracking <laughs> device, or, I don't know, a vacuum cleaner that could clean up her dirty-ass huts? Instead, you built her a protocol droid. You know who could use a protocol droid in The Phantom Menace? Senators on the Senate floor that are trying to talk to senators that speak a billion different languages. So I never just, understood why C-3PO wasn't introduced as, when they go to Coruscant, as just the translator droid assigned to the Naboo, instead of being built by Anakin, which is the most dumb shit thing to happen in those movies. I'm going to just Well, we, we can also talk about the whole a slave building a slave thing going <laughs> yeah. on. Touche. We'll, we'll put that one aside. Does he speak but, We call that Southern logic. <laughs> I'm bothered, uh, you know, the the original trilogy was, you know, the greatest movie series of my childhood, and with the new series, and I'm not taking pot shots at The Last Jedi yet. here, not yet, um, the segment isn't over yet, <laughs> but uh, I'm bothered that the government that got put into power by Leia, who's one of my all-time heroes, like, really sucked and only lasted 30 years. I mean, it's essentially like like Fidel Castro's government lasted longer than Leia's government. And I'm also bothered by Luke and Han not actually learning anything. And that the, the things that they were supposed to learn in the original trilogy, um, they show up as completely different people who've sort of regressed. And that, that really bothers me. And we talked a lot ad nauseum about Last Jedi and how you liked it, but I, I don't. But I, I see, I find that interesting because I don't think Han regressed. I think Han was reverted to what he was at the start of A New Hope. Right. And that's what all of what kind of Abrams did. Like, that's why the government was destroyed so quickly and all those things is because Abrams tried to take a world that had progressed through the original trilogy and he tried to reset it back to episode four. And that's See? what he did. And, and 
I, you know, like the, the Luke argument's different. Like we have different opinions about whether he regressed or whether he progressed and that progress ended up killing his spirit, um, which is a, a different argument. And there's good, good arguments on both sides of that. But um, I think it was the trade off of wanting Abrams to bring this world back to what was familiar meant we had to sacrifice a lot of the things that the characters had done throughout the course of their personal histories. And you kind of can't have one without the other. And if you love The Phantom Menace, or uh, The Force Awakens, like a lot of people do, I do love it. you have to be able to accept those those kind of the give back. I accept I accept it, but it pisses me off. I think you could have worked Han into that situation without him regressing his character. I totally disagree that that he didn't regress. He the 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 major thing that that can and Mark will get to you in just a second here. I see you waving. Um, the major thing that that character learns is that he can't do it by himself, that he needs a family, that he needs those people, that he is not in fact solo and immediately loses that or not immediately, but over the course of the 30 years and in all that that regression Happens off screen. But he has no tribe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a sick burn! Mark! That regression made sense, though, because you look at where he was, okay? He starts out as a smuggler, he becomes this general, right? The war's over, he gets married, he's settling into probably the life of a politician, right? He has a son, and oh, it turns out that the son is a crazy, effed up, you know, Sith wannabe, right? His marriage falls apart. So what does he do? He goes back to what it is he knows, being a smuggler, where he was comfortable. It it makes sense for his character to regress. To yeah, I just don't want it to happen off screen. All the trauma in the last 30 years. If, if, if one of my favorite characters of all time in any anything ever, in any fictional universe, is going to go through that big of a situation, I don't want it to be done in, in a... In a flashback or in exposition given through dialogue. Don't worry, I'm, I'm yeah, sure Disney will make all those movies throughout time. I don't so. think they are. Hey, it just came out that uh, Solo's not getting a sequel. So, but well, yeah, but we have we have and beyond our lifetime of Star Wars movies that will be coming. So, at some point, they probably will. And there's a bigger, and you're getting at the biggest problem with the Force Awakens right there is that there was so much that happened off screen. You know, the entire collapse of this new Republican. Oh, hey, the Empire's back, and okay, they're winning again, right? I mean, that was the whole problem with that movie to begin with. Well, one of the many problems, anyway. But Han's regression, to me, at least made sense, given what the character went through, even though he saw it off screen. So, you're This is why I accept it. I just don't, I just don't like it. Mike, can I, can I ask you a question, though, since yeah. you brought up the Solo being announced as not a sequel? Mark, oh, yeah. feel free to weigh in if you want, but obviously you haven't seen it, so you probably aren't able to. What is your, what is your biggest disappointment about it not getting a sequel? What did you want? I love Han and Chewie. Okay. And, I, and I love Alden Ehrenreich as Han, and I know he's not the same as Harrison Ford, but I really love that dynamic. I mean, I I could have answered this in our last episode when we were talking about uh, Fantastic Four and, and movies that everybody else hates. Like, I love Solo. Like, it's, it's way higher on my list than it should be, and I love Han and Chewie so much. And, like, there was that little, like, trailer when they're, like, having a snowball fight. I'm, I'm embarrassed that I'm saying this, but there's, like, a trailer when they're having a snowball fight. And I was like, oh, man, I gotta get that. I gotta get I actually haven't been able to get it right away because I was waiting for a paycheck from my new job and I had to wait till the next oh, paycheck. Sure. So I'm a little disappointed, but I, I, I just love that camaraderie. Because I, I, this is not going to shock you, of course, but now feeling like we're going to get cheated out of what a would have been like a full Darth Maul yeah. related villain movie oh, just kills me. Like that's, that's, I want that so badly. I, I so want a movie about Darth Maul and his criminal empire, whether he's the, the person that they're focusing on primarily, or he's the main villain of someone like Solo having had that dangled in our face and having been so excited about that because I love everything I've ever seen about Darth Maul and to have it like teased and then taken away is oh I really like Kira. I like Kira too and I and I know like you know a lot of people can take her or leave her but um I think it would have been a really cool movie to have her as a villain the next time because if we want to explain Han Solo and actually do it on film instead of in a in a exposition that's given by dialogue um I think it would have been really cool to see why he's so bitter um, and see her because he has no tribe. 
Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. I'm, I'm glad they're not doing it. Nobody should have played Han Solo other than Harrison Ford. And I actually am fine with no more Darth Maul. In fact, I thought that less Darth Maul, even in Phantom Menace, would have been better if they'd have cut out his dialogue. If he had been silent and reduced just to those scenes in Phantom Menace, there was absolute perfect amount. I, I agree with you in the context of Phantom Menace. If he would have had no dialogue, he would have been better. But seeing what he, he is in the Clone Wars and what he is beyond the Clone Wars, it it makes it worth it. My question to you guys, because I have my answer already in my head, I think one of you guys will take it. What's your favorite Darth Maul moment? Well, the I for me, the lightsaber battle on Naboo at the end of that movie is the best lightsaber yeah. battle in Star Wars. The only one that I think is even close is um is the Last Jedi guardroom fight with Rey and Kylo Ren. That fight is outstanding, and and my favorite part of that fight isn't flipping in action. It's when everyone's trapped in the energy shields, yeah, and he just paces back and forth and stares at them like the tigers do at the zoo when you're there. Like just that pure animal. They're there, you know. Qui Gon's trying to meditate and be calm, and Obi Wan looks nervous as fuck, and he's just pacing as this unstoppable animal. Like that's my favorite what? by far. My moment is actually, it's from the first trailer, the moment when you see him and he whips out the lightsaber, Yeah. the second blade extends. The first time I saw that, I have never been more excited for a movie in my entire life than the moment when I saw a double-bladed lightsaber. Yeah, that was pretty badass. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, guys. It's time for Stevie Weiserman's favorite game show. It's Am I Right or Am I Wrong? Here's how our two-player game works. Seven questions. Champion's going to go first, I think, or are you... What's well, it's name? a contender match. Oh, so it's I, I won that right. Well, I, I, re, I tied right. and retained my title last week, so now we need to have another number one contender match. That's fair. To see who I face the following. So, week. since I beat I, Mark last time, do I go first? Is yes, that how this, okay, yes, because, so. yeah, you're higher ranked. Okay, so I'm going to go first, and our challenger, Mark Neitzel, is going to go second, and then we're going to flip-flop in a serpentine style. At the end of each question, the point's going to go to whoever is correct, or if the answers are similar whichever one luke likes better if there's a draw there's a draw there's no overtime here you gotta win it in regulation don't worry if there's a tie we'll go to sudden death Ooh. Ooh. this game is getting oh, testy oh. i mean death eventually one of us is gonna die in this game exactly i've got a feeling it'll be me <laughs> Well, Maybe, you're hard to get to especially when it, yeah it's gonna be a ben affleck related category <laughs> if we go to sudden death so get excited for that we're going to start out in Major League Soccer. Hey the league announced the 2019 All-Star Game. It's going to be held in sunny Orlando, Florida. And though not officially announced, it appears that LAFC and Minnesota United look to be locks for 2020 and 2021. Now, Major League Soccer is a very different than other North American All-Star Games. Instead of featuring two teams making up, made up of existing uh, players in the league, they make one all-star team and that team faces a powerhouse team from another country so the mls all-stars took on a ronaldo less juventus this year in uh atlanta just a year after taking on a ronaldo less real madrid in chicago and as we're moving forward we're looking at these all-star games would you prefer this format or would you prefer a more traditional east versus west mile model or wild card would you prefer a completely different model that I haven't mentioned? Maya, we begin with you. I like the current system. I think it's fun because a lot of U.S. soccer fans are fans not only of MLS, but also of European teams. So I think that that part's fun. Um, obviously, there's going to be a time when the league wants to do something different and just sort of showcase the league. There's starting to be more and more just mls fans but i don't think that time is is around yet and i think we we stay the course i think uh the the tickets always sell well for that game and it's a lot of fun for the fans so and it's different than any of the other sports leagues so, like that so the, the, the question refresh my memory is what are they going to do or what do i think they should what, do what do you think they should do what format do you want for the all-star game Oh, well, I'm going to say I want the same format as I think they should have for every other league and not have the stupid game at all. 
you just name the players who would be the all-star team and leave it at that. Um, especially, I mean, you know, baseball, okay, because it's such a low-impact sport and nobody ever really gets hurt in baseball. Um, that's fine. But to have a game in the middle of the season, to take players out, to add travel, to add, even though it's a meaningless game, to add the potential of injury uh, to any of your big stars for what is a glorified you know, exhibition match, I, I don't care for it. So I would just make it an honorary title and move on, eliminate the game altogether. Oh, Mark does not like getting money from Don Garber because, man, they like those attendance and those draws. The correct answer is keep it the same. It helps draw in more casual fans. We can all attest, because Mark, you went to the All-Star Game in San Jose against Arsenal. Maya and I went to the one in Chicago against Real Madrid. You have an opportunity to bring in fans that are in the U.S. that are too snobby for MLS and give them a chance to see your team play, your players play. Uh, you know, you get to watch Dom Dwyer score in the 80th minute to bring it to a to bring it to a shootout. Uh, it's great exposure for the league to do it. They also get people in other countries to watch because they're trying to check out Real Madrid or Arsenal or Juventus or Manchester United. It's 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 a good way for the league to showcase itself. The other thing that I wrote down is an idea that I've heard on shows like Extra Time Radio. It would be pretty badass if they had MLS All Stars versus Liga MX All Stars. Oh, I would. I would get into that pretty, Ooh, okay, pretty hardcore. Yeah, I didn't even consider so, that. I actually I had that written down that you get two if, points if you say that. If you did it at the end of the season, though, I don't like the middle of the season. But whose stuff. end of the season is the problem there? Because they are on different calendars. Um, which America, is why we lose at Concacaf Champions League. Biased opinion. America's because. Mexico's paying for the wall, so we do what they tell them. Obviously. So Maya gets the point there, and we are moving into question two. Mark mentioned this last week when he was running the questions, but we are both insanely eagerly anticipating the arrival of October 25th. Because on October 25th, both of us, even though we are thousands of miles apart, will be sitting in different theaters watching our favorite and the best movie of all time, Night of the Living Dead, on the big screen for the first time ever for either of us. Now, I feel pretty lucky because we've been able to go back and see a lot of the classic, awesome, all-time movies on the big screen. Uh, my first ever date was to go see Star Wars on the big screen for the first time, as well as seeing uh, The Exorcist on the big screen. And for me, one of the, the, the best movie theater experience I ever had is I saw the best movie ever made, the Fritz Lang classic Metropolis, at the Milwaukee Film Festival with a live orchestra playing the music. So... I think it's an exciting time when you can go see old movies that you love on the big theater. So my question for you guys, and we're going to start with Mark, is what movie have you never seen on the big screen that you would pick for a one-night engagement? Hmm. Movie that I've never seen on the big screen. I am going to go with The Godfather Part 2 because, one... It's really long, so I'm getting my money's worth out of the whole experience, right? Uh, number two, I think so much of the um, flashback parts with the Italian vistas and old New York would really just look amazing in a widescreen format where I can really kind of appreciate the, the whole grandeur of those sets and those locations um, the way I just can't at home on TV. For me, I'm going to go with another Brando movie and I'm going to go with it because I think it's got better visuals. Uh, maybe not as good of a story, but it's still a movie that really sits with me. It's Apocalypse Now. Um, mm. I, I love that movie and it took me way too long to see it, but um, it gets me just as much as Godfather 2 got me, but I think visually it's a much better movie and so I'll go Apocalypse Now. So... I knew you guys would never get the correct answer I had written down. There wasn't really a fair chance because Mark has seen this in the big theater and Maya has never seen this. So the answer for me, the correct answer is Mad Max Fury Road. Because what an amazing movie. effing movie. I, I just saw it with, recently. Oh, did you really? Yeah. With insanity visuals. Right. Like, I can't yeah. imagine. And, and I'll give Mark a little credit because he called me a million times and said, you see it in the theater. And I was like, no, nah, it's fine. I'll wait till I rent it. 
And now it's one of my biggest regrets is I didn't just go see that in the theater because yeah. it would have been a, insane. I'm going to give you guys a tie. You're going to each get a point on this, which really just helps Maya. So I see your point, Maya. Of, like The Godfather Part Two was a better movie. Apocalypse Now probably has the better visuals, but there are going to be some epic landscape shots in Godfather 2 as well that need to be appreciated. So I just, I can't pick out of those two. So you each get a point for that. So well done. Now, Brando. Uh, Brando. I love Brando. Yeah. He's a bad guy, but hey, yeah. whatever happens. So is everybody we talk about. Yeah, right. but he, he, he rapes he, that one he, actress with a stick of butter. So oh, that's, God. yeah. But it made excellent Apocalypse in the MCU though. Yes, you really would have. Those mouth lines would have been something. So, question three. Patricia Clarkson recently spoke about the ending of one of my biggest obsessions over the summer, which was the HBO miniseries Sharp Objects. Now, the show was based on a book by Gone Girl author G Gillian Flynn and starred Amy Adams as a troubled reporter who was forced to deal with her unpleasant childhood. Now, in this interview with Entertainment Weekly, Clarkson shared her ideas on how the story should have ended. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one who watched it out of us three, so I'm not going to ask you guys questions specifically about this. But I am going to extend a ton of praise to Patricia Clarkson, who is shines as Amy Adams' crazy-ass mom. This is the type of performance I've come to expect from Patricia Clarkson, who is an actress who never, ever gets a starring role. So my question for you is, what actor or actress is currently underappreciated and needs to get more starring roles? And I believe this time we are going to start with Maya. Uh, my my favorite is, and the first time that I really noticed him was in Captain America, the first Avenger. But Stanley, and I'm going to pronounce his last name wrong, Stanley Tucci. Tucci. Um, Tucci. Tucci. Um, I think he's just phenomenal. Every role that I've seen him in, he completely... Be like gets into that role so much that I forget who he is and I always think he's someone else and um, that's my favorite character actor there is. Mark? Um, so I'm going to go with one. Uh, this is going to be another callback to last episode, but this really got me thinking when rumors of him being potentially cast as the next Superman came out. But Michael B. Jordan, give that guy every freaking starring role in every movie. He is nothing but charisma, talented actor. He can carry any franchise you can imagine. So, and he's got tremendous upside and he's young. So this is a guy that you can have for years and years. And he's going to be able to pull off just about anything you ask of him in any genre, from action to drama to comedy to romance. It's, and, and, you know, he, he makes me ask uncomfortable questions about myself when I see him on a big screen. So, uh, oh. Mike Jordan. His, his turn in both Fruitvale Station and the final season of Friday Night Lights are brilliant. I have a question for you, Mark. Do mm -hmm. you remember uh, your comments about your frustration about Ben Affleck? In our last, uh -huh. am I right, am I wrong? Because the answer written down on paper is Stanley. No Lee. way! No way! No way! Gotta be kidding me! Bam! Bam! I. Oh! Oh my god! That is insanity. That is Dude. a guy who is a yeah, supporting. We've never talked about him. Never talked about it. That is a supporting actor in every movie, and he steals every movie he is in. He's married to Emily Blunt's sister, who might be hotter than Emily Blunt. Mark, as good as your answer is, he already stars in things. I can, I almost, like, to keep my entire face straight while you were going through that, it, I deserve an Academy Award. Look at that shit. Right there. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Mark, you are in trouble. Trained Maybe it. you should show more Trained respect it. to Ben Affleck because you got a lot of work to do right now, my friend. Question four. We are closing in on the most anticipated movie of the year. We are a few weeks out from the release of Tom Hardy's Venom. <laughs> yes. And I cannot be more excited. While the announcement of a PG-13 rating is a bit of a letdown, I was hoping to see maybe a more violent symbiote in this movie. But the 112-minute runtime is relatively appealing since movies are all way too long nowadays. So the start of this movie 
kind of signals the wave of a bunch of villain movies. We got word this week that uh, Joaquin Phoenix has started filming his Joker movie, and the Rocked Black Adam movie is not far from being on the, the you know, whatever, going semi-drunk. Anyways, and we also still have a live Noah Hawley's Doctor Doom movie, which I am really hoping happens because I'm a big fan of Noah Hawley. So we're going to take those guys out because we're going to count their movies as already happening. What, listen to this word, genre, so not comic book, but what genre villain deserves to have their own movie? Now, it could be a comic book guy if that's what you want, but we're opening it up to more than just genre. And I believe we are going to start with Mark. Okay. Stanley Tucci. I can't believe you guys. Oh my God, <laughs> trained it. The, the thousands of listeners at home can't see this, but I am giving Luke the finger as hard as I have ever given anybody in my entire life right now. <laughs> like, a, Stanley Tucci. like a moon a night. <laughs> oh, okay. So what genre villain, or what villain in any genre? Yeah, so like genre movies, you know, so horror, sci-fi, you know, those type of things, comic book, whatever. What villain needs to have their own movie dedicated to them? Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say this answer, and I'm actually going to feel a little creepy about it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I feel like, especially after having seen Fincher's Zodiac, I feel like there is a really good horror movie to be made out of Joseph James D'Angelo, the East Area Rapist original Night Stalker. Um, I, I, I don't necessarily even feel great about saying that since he's you know, just been caught and he's on trial and his victims are still alive and there's you know, the you know, whole sense of profiting off of trauma, but maybe, you know, Hopefully, with, with a good director, I feel like you could make a really, really powerful horror movie out of that guy. So, like usual in this game, I'm stuck between two answers. The first answer is my favorite villain of all time, which is not my answer, but my favorite villain of all time is the Wicked Witch of the West, which is you know in the you know the Wicked and the the Broadway show, and I think and I really like the uh, the Oz movie from that Disney just did, uh, but I'm gonna go with theme, and I'm gonna go with brand, and it's Vader. We saw in 30 seconds what a real villain-focused Darth Vader moment could be, and that's what everybody wants, both everybody who listens to this show and everybody in who, who went to Rogue One. We all want that but greatest, either the greatest or the second greatest villain of all time. Give me a real Vader, not Anakin, a real Vader movie. That's what I want. So the, the answer I had written down is that I wanted Roy Batty from the original Blade Runner. Because that is a villain that is arguably a villain. And to see the story of how he escaped and the motivations that he has, I think, would be an amazing villain. Um, that That's one of the best. That is the my favorite monologue in movie history, I think, is Roy Batty's ending monologue about why he does what he does and why he's tormenting Harrison Ford. I would have loved to have seen that be what the Blade Runner movie is, even though I really liked the the new Blade Runner movie. I'm going to have to go with Mark here on this point because we got three movies about Vader, pre-Vader, and I know you kind of tried to throw that stipulation in there, but we, we kind of got that and it kind of sucked. That's not Vader. Um, you like the prequels. What are you talking about? Uh, I really like the third one. Um, but anyways, I, I do think that a movie from uh, as horrible a person as he is is the, the EAR would be crazy interesting so i'm gonna have to go mark on that one so it is now uh throwing out the tie points it is two to one maya as we move to question five and this is going to be a real minefield question oh, God. for you oh. guys so i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna gauge you both to step warn you both to step lightly because wando watch is still on as we wait to see if Earthquakes Forward, Quiz Wondolowski can overtake Landon Donovan to become the all-time leading scorer in Major League Soccer. Now I'm, you know, we're filming this one a week out because I have to go on vacation. Have to go on vacation because I'm going on vacation next week. But he currently sits less than ten goals away from the record of 145 goals. All right. So, in my personal opinion, anyone who scores over 100 
goals, and that includes Jeff Cunningham. So break ups to you. I like Jeff Cunningham. Well, I think I... But anyone who scores a hundred plus goals deserves mass credit to be remembered in Major League Soccer history. One guy that everyone should have their eye on right now because today he scored a hat trick and he's only going to score more is a hundred and I think five now goal scorer Bradley Wright Phillips of the New York Red Bulls. Where do you rate Bradley Wright Phillips in the pantheon of MLS goal scorers? And we are going to start with Maya. Was um. He's done it kind of quietly when you when you think of the success that they haven't really had in the playoffs. And so, uh, for me, I know this is kind of a cop-out answer, but lower than he should. I mean, I don't think of him as one of the greats, not because of ability. Just like I don't think of Eddie Murray as one of the great home run hitters of all time, even though he was for a team that I really liked. They didn't do anything in the playoffs, and he hasn't yet. The second that he does... He's going to be, you know, along with that, that top echelon, but he just hasn't proven it yet when it really counts. Mark? Um, so where does he rank? Um, well, I think, I mean, obviously Landon Donovan ranks one, even if Wando and eventually Joseph Martinez break the record. Uh, he's clearly number one. Um, I would probably put him at least right now, maybe three or four. Um, I'm going to put Wando at number two, partially because I am a homer, and I have always admitted this about myself, but also because I think Wando not only rode the bench for a good part of his early career, and so he didn't have the number of game reps that somebody like Donovan did, um, he has consistently been in double digits on horrible Quakes teams. Um, I mean, everybody remembers 2012 when he got he tied for the, the single season record, and he had tons of great support then. But before and after, he was playing a real shit team, or he's playing on a real shit team. And he's still, he's still producing I'm going to put them, I would say either three or four-ish. Jesus Christ, you guys are making this one real, real hard. Okay? Because you both gave horrible answers. So so what I'm going to say is, is like, he is one of the most underappreciated players in the history of Major League Soccer. He is insane how much he scores. If he was American, we would be jerking each other off about how great he is. But he played in the championship, so everyone goes, well, you're a failed EPL player, rather than just being a really, really awesome Major League Soccer player. So, reluctantly, this point's going to go to Mark, because... Maya, you completely undersold him. Mark, mm-hmm. you gave him a high ranking, but you turned it into a stupid-ass monologue about Chris Wondolowski, which I was not looking for. So, Wando. Bradley Larry Phillips is awesome. We should appreciate him more. He scores in the playoffs. It's not his fault. No one else does. Bradley Wright Phillips forever. Can I, uh, can I tell you one thing? Hmm. I, I was looking up goal ratio. He's got a .62. The leaders uh, all-time in, in goals, uh, .43 for Landon. Uh, 0.46 for Wando, 0.37 for Cunningham, 0.39 for Moreno, uh, 0.43 for Razov, 0.35 for both Kreis and my guy, Kai Kamara, 0.30 for Dero. But you know who would have the second best all time on this list? Rodney Wallace, hopefully. 0.58, Taylor Twelman, everybody's Uh, favorite uh, bad guy. All right, maybe we should throw the whole question out because Taylor Twelman <laughs> apparently. Uh, I saw him score a goal and get an assist against Japan for the national team. I saw him bang his head against a post and not win MLS Cup. So fuck that guy. I get to see Ooh. MLS Cup. Anyways, moving on. So Mark is able to tie it, kind of coming out of, out of nowhere. We have two questions left, so this is make or break time, people. And we run into the uh, the tediousness of do I want to be honest? Do I want Mark to not write questions, or do I want Mark to lose? So it's it's a real real hard battle going here. So a while back, Marvel dove into the world of podcasts, which we're obviously a fan of, with Wolverine the Long Night. Now this has been a kind of a sense of annoyance for a lot of us because this venture was only available on Stitcher's pay platform, and I am not paying Stitcher to listen to a Wolverine podcast. But recently it made it, its debut on all the other podcast formats. And I just started it, and I'm about halfway through the first episode, and I'm pretty good with it so far. So we're all big podcast fans, but we all tend to gravitate towards true nonfiction podcasts. 
What type of story do you want in a fictional podcast that would make you listen to it? I am going to go, what is this, Mark's turn. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, in a fictional podcast, so obviously when you're doing podcasts, when you're doing radio, right, you have to be something that is heavy on dialogue because you can't really be doing lots of narration. Um, action is difficult to convey. So I'm really going to be interested in something that even if it's fiction that is presented in a, you know, breaking news interview kind of way. I mean, I think War of the Worlds, the original one, is really the template right there, where it's news broadcasts about a fictional event, right? It's using the form and using the limitations of the form and the contours of the form to describe the, the fictional events. So I need it to play into what it is and not pretend to be something else. Um, like uh, the, the Limehouse podcast would have been really good had they done it better, had they had better actors and better writing, but the idea was there, and I would have been totally on board with that. My the the thing that would get me is just mysteries. I mean, that's what gets me to listen to podcasts, the the true crime mysteries, and I really enjoy uh, fiction uh, mysteries, both uh, printed and movies. And so I think for me, that would be the answer. So I'm gonna have to go with Maya for two reasons. First, Mark, your answer was kind of like Limetown, but not shitty, which isn't really an answer because Limetown's shitty. Um, also, Stanley Tucci. <laughs> Woo! So point Maya. <laughs> That means we have one question left. So, Mark, you got to pull this out here if you want to have any chance of going to sudden death. SpaceX is close to announcing its first tourism flight around the moon. All right? So as time moves forward and we get more advanced in our space technology, I watched Star Trek First, Contract in theater, first Contact in theaters, so I know a lot about this. The farther we get technologically, the closer we come to contact with life from other planets. Walk me through what your version of First Contact will be like. Maya, we start with you. I think we already saw this this week when the New Mexico uh, the New Mexico Observatory shut down and everybody in the area was asked to leave and the government won't say why. So I think what's going to first happen is that we will find uh, evidence. The government sphincter will tighten up and it'll immediately try to... Um, you know, get a hold of the situation, and then from then on, I think it's just pure fucking bloodbath <laughs> just taking over. Because if they're here, there's a reason they're here. And if they haven't talked to us so far, and if they've been real cagey, if you believe in aliens, uh, when they come, it's going to be serious and we're done for. Mark? The aliens will land on my front lawn. They're going to teach me how to smoke and how to throw the finger, and how to steal the jam box by hiding it inside my body. And when I try and say no, I will be powerless to fight back because their vertical leap is vastly superior to mine. So I, I have the answer down as, you know, like, our first contact will be unmanned machines because we send probes, they're going to send probes, all those other things. But Mark, you win. Like, that was <laughs> that was well done. So we're, we're going to give that to Mark, which means... We are tied at 4-4, four four, technically, with the tie points, which means... Hey, Maya. Yeah. Hey, Maya. Fill your eyes with double vision. <laughs> which means we're moving into sudden death. And this is important because it's for the number one contender spot. So that means you'll be playing me the following week it is to try to win loser. the title. Exactly. So this ben is Affleck. our sudden death question. And it comes ben from Affleck. the movies... Of DC. We all know that Suicide Squad number two scribe, or Suicide Squad two, the, the, the screenwriter has said he has put out his first draft and he thinks it's the best thing he has ever written. Tell me what you think was the best part of Suicide Squad number one. We are going to start with Mark because Maya started there. Hmm. The best part of Suicide Squad number one is the use of uh, Sweet's Ballroom Blitz in the trailer. 
Okay. And now we go to Maya. I desperately want to say uh, Ben Affleck's Batman. Um, but oh, he go, is oh, in it. Yeah. Yes. You know what? I'm going to say Ben he Affleck's is, Batman. He is in it. Oh, my gosh. Point to Maya. First off, Mark, we have to tell you that, you know what? It is a good use, but Wayne's World did it better, so it loses the point for that. And again, these are Ben Affleck-related questions. So well yeah. done, Maya. We also... Yeah, my Tucci. We also would have accepted Captain Boomerang because that actor whose name escapes me is a giant, giant. pile of... G Jai Courtney is a giant pile of garbage in everything but being Captain Boomerang in Suicide Squad. So, that means Maya is our winner! Good job, Maya. You are number one contender. Mark, we look to see you next week when you write questions and then maybe try again in a few weeks. You said that perfectly. And I don't care because I got you to say Mr. Perfect was the greatest Intercontinental Champion. For a minor title, he did well. Oh my so goodness, where are we? I gotta, I gotta get to back to my notes. We are ready for a question, even though we're 45 minutes into this Oh episode. my goodness. Um, well, if you're out there, perhaps feeling lonely, maybe you like uh, Mark Neitzel and his funniness, or... Maybe you like the smug attitude of his little but taller brother. Or maybe you're drawn to the lazy surfer voice of one Maya Madrid. Maybe you just need someone to talk to. In the words of John Lennon, if you're lonely, you can talk to me. Then he beat his wife. Yeah, he probably did. Email the show, tweet the show, immerse yourself in the show. There were no questions this week, which is probably good because we're running over. We are going fast. Uh, let's, go, uh, let's go to The Clone Wars. Season 2, Episode 10, <coughs> The Deserter. In the quest for honor, it is the quest for honor that makes one honorable. I mean, was that it? That was it. Oh. Written by Carl Ellsworth and directed by newcomer Robert Dalva, this episode follows the chase for Grievous, but seems more focused with a smaller story about Rex and one of his long-lost brothers. Luke, take it away. So, this episode is a continuation of the last one. Grievous has escaped, blowing up all those ships, and has landed with his uh, droids on this new planet we no one has ever been to. And Obi-Wan is desperate to get him, so he is going to lead a squadron, including Rex and Cody, down there to go find him and take him back. And we have basically two plots that are going on in this. One is very minor and forgettable, and that is the Pursuit of Grievous, which has Grievous and a bunch of his droids trying to find another escape pod that has crash landed and killed all the droids in it, but has a workable transmitter so they can signal for another ship. So Grievous and his droids, who are losing power and shutting down, are making their way towards this transmitter, while Obi-Wan and his group of tanks pursue them. They eventually end up meeting up and battling, and as always, Grievous kind of loses, but is able to escape. So that is really the B-plot of this episode, and it doesn't take up much time. What the A-plot of this show is is that Rex and a group of clones go out on their own, for a reason I don't remember offhand. And while they are going there, Rex is shot by a sniper of one of the commando droids, just, just, you know, east of his heart, to the point where he is gravely wounded. They end up killing the sniper and the other bots, but they're droids, but they realize that they need to do something with Rex. These clones end up finding that they are on a farm, so they tech... They take Rex to the farm, hoping the farmer will help them, and we meet a woman there named Sue, who is kind of like the slave girl in Jabba's Pit, but she's pink, and she has two kids, and she says that she doesn't really want them there, but she will let them stay in the barn. She also has a French accent. Did you notice that? She does have a French accent, yeah. Yeah, and it is kind of French countryside farm vineyard type mm -hmm. thing that they're going through yeah. because, man, Clone Wars loves accents. And stereotypes. And scantily clad women. And, yeah, she was falling out of her uh, v-neck tube top or whatever she had going on. But anyways, uh, Rex is then put up in this, and they talk about how uh, one of the kids is like, oh, you look just like my dad. Wink, wink. And the mom says, no, no, don't worry about that. And they realize Rex is wounded, so they put some type of thing on him that's going to heal him, and then they all leave. So it's just Rex in this farm. And in the middle of the night, the dad comes home and kind of sneaks in with a pole. 
and Rex is able to kind of stop him, but we realize that the dad is a clone who has fleed the Republic. So, dun, dun, dun. Exactly, and Rex is pissed. He's like, you should be arrested and turned in for being a deserter. This is a really big deal, etc., etc. And they sit down and have a conversation about why he did it. And the reason he left is because he was in a you know, a, a ship that was shot down and everyone was injured. And while they were injured, the droids just went around executing everyone that was injured. And he was able to run away. And he just decided, I'm going to run away from all of this because I was born with the express purpose of being murdered to fight for these wars that I want nothing to do with. So he ran away and he started this family and he kind of has some conversations with Rex in a very, my dinner with Andre fashion about how Rex thinks that he, his family is the Republic and he's fighting for something greater and he really believes in it. And the, uh, his name is cut 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 says, you know, my family is what I believe in and I'm going to fight for them. You might think I'm a coward, but I would kill for my family and they kind of have these conversations, and the kids end up wandering and finding a pod and setting off some more commando droids. And then they wander in, and um, the, the droids... And there's a big fight, and basically what Cut says is, Rex, you're injured. You stay here and protect my family. I'm going to go try and kill all these droids. A battle breaks out. Um, Rex defends the family. They work together. They destroy these things. Uh, meanwhile, Grievous has escaped. Obi-Wan is ready to give up and go back to his fleet. He communicates with Rex, and right before we kind of go to credits, you know, the Rex and Cut have a conversation where, you know, Cut says, well, you know, I suppose you want to try to arrest me, and Rex is like, I should, but I'm going to forget what happened here and let you go. And they kind of have an understanding about who each other are, and, um... Rex leaves, and we fade to credits. Now, this has been one of our longest shows. We're really going fast through this. I thought this episode was really good. My big complaint about this episode is that it was too short, and I wish they wouldn't have had the B-plot at all. Because I felt like the B-plot just distracted away from what was interesting, which was the conversations between Rex and Cut about what the clones are. And Mark, you may not know this, but we had a similar episode in season one where we had another clone who was a traitor, and he was a traitor because he's like, you just breed us to get murdered, so why would I help you? I'm going to betray everything. Um, and I liked that episode a lot, but I like this one better because this is a guy who just wasn't evil. Like, he was nuanced. Like, he had other things that were important to him that he was willing to change his life into, and, and Rex understood that. So... I did not see this episode coming. I felt like this episode had more depth than we normally get. I had a good time with it. And again, my big complaint is I wanted more time with Rex and Cut than we got out of this. So, you know, uh, you know, M Miss Miss Neitzel, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say your, your actual name. Uh, I hope you're listening right now because pew, 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 pew. <laughs> Mark, yeah, I, I love so, uh, Cut is far and away the most interesting character that this series has had, at least as far as I've seen. Um, it almost as if they pulled him from some other show or movie. Um, the the level of depth and and darkness that they were willing to get into in explaining his motives was really amazing. And um, you know, there was a couple. The, the B-plot was, eh, whatever. We had the comedy droids again, which annoy me. Um, and there's some plot stuff about how the, you know, how does the wife not know that he's a deserter and that her husband's clone in the barn is a problem, right? She should have been camped out to prevent him from walking in on this. So um, I, I disagree with that a little bit because I think she did know because the little girl is like, you look just like my dad. And she's like quick to dismiss it. Like, no, don't bring that up. So I think she was, I think they were just good people because they make the comments in there like, we have to help people. If people are in need, we're going to help them. So I think she didn't want Rex there. She knew exactly what Rex was and what his problem was, but she morally was like, I can't let you leave because you'll die on right. your own. But, but what she should have done then is simply, you know, put him in the barn, close the barn door, wait outside till husband gets home and say, hey, go hide in the basement until this guy clears out in the morning. 
Uh, I think Cud had too much pride for that. I don't think he would have stood for that. I think he he wanted to protect his family, so he was going to assess Rex and what the threat was. I I bought no. this storyline. I bought everything between Rex, Cut, and Cut's family. Like I bought all of it. Like I well, I really thought it worked. I, you know, but I mean, this is getting away from my point. Was that even this was minor for me because it was so the rest of it with Cut was so well done that I found myself just not caring. And yeah, had they given that the full episode, they could have fleshed some of that stuff out a little more and it would have been even better. But yeah, no, it was, it was, it was tremendous. I'm sad that we're probably not going to see more of this character. Um, I think it's one of those things where you really, really like something in short supply, but if they just kept bringing him back, I think it would lose its meaning. I think this is one of the best episodes of the entire series. It is only the third favorite episode of this particular season, and the reason why I like uh, Brain Invaders and Weapons Factory a little bit more is because those episodes have a really stark moment when you think that one of these newly introduced characters that you care about, and, my, and Barris is probably my favorite character of the series, and Cut might be number two, uh, he might, you know, him or Cad Bane, um, that you, I thought that they were going to kill Barris two different times, and I think this could have done the same thing and gotten a little bit heart-wrenching if they had made you think that they were going to kill Cut or one of his kids, and it seemed like they were pulling up to that, and I think that they that would have put it over the edge as my favorite episode of all time. I love this episode, though. Um, I think it's it's as good as Rookies and just a notch below as Brain Invaders and Weapons Factory. I think this is the best. Whether well, it, it may not be everyone's favorite episode, I think it's the best written episode mm-hmm. yeah. we've seen in in a season and a half. Like yeah, I I this this was the episode that I watched and I went for everything we've heard about how season two elevates things. This is where it hit me, like, this is a next-level episode, and if we can get more things in this vein, then we're really on to something. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of really being on to something, let's talk about other nerd news that we're into. Mark! And I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. Okay, so, um, I am back on Twitter again. I think this is my third time and um, I'm already regretting it because I made the mistake of looking into something that is called Comics Gate. Are either of you familiar with this? Just just from your Twitter account. Uh, I'm not. Yeah. So basically like every other thing where a bunch of pissed off white guys who are unable to make it in a particular field, decide that they're going to blame all their bad luck on women, on gays, on minorities. And it's it's pretty obvious, you know, the usual awfulness that, I mean, we've discussed similar um, with, like, the response to the character of Rose Tico in Last Jedi. And I don't want to, I don't want to discuss it. I don't want to rehash it. I don't want to get involved in it any more than I have to. I want to go the opposite route. And the previous times when I've been responsible for doing the other nerd stuff, uh, I think the last two, I've talked about uh, Kelly Thompson's Hawkeye, which features uh, Kate Bishop, a young female protagonist as Hawkeye. And prior to that, I talked about G. Willow Wilson's Miss Marvel, which is about a young uh, second generation Muslim American woman who is also a superhero. And so I wanted to focus and I wanted to talk to you and ask you guys about other comics, other movies, other TV shows, things that are good that involve non straight white male protagonists. Uh, Because I've also been finding that my own reading experience, and, and I read more than anything else. I don't watch that much TV outside of sports. I don't see that many movies. So it, for me, it's reading. But I've been finding lately how interesting and enriching it's been by reading about these experiences um, from people with different viewpoints, talking about characters from different viewpoints. And I, I have another new one that I just finished that I can talk about as well, but 
I, I first off, I wanted to, to kind of throw it out to you guys. Um, not even you talk about it, but maybe give me some ideas about things that I could be reading and looking at to, to really help me get this new kind of perspective and, and to learn about people other than myself. I don't think I have a good answer for you, to be perfectly honest. The, the thing that immediately comes to mind for me is one of my favorite movies of all time, and that's The Wizard of Oz. That was the first movie that I really identified with a female protagonist, seeing that as a child. That's got a great... It, it, this, either the greatest or the second greatest villain who's also a female and um i always just come back to that when i'm thinking about things in 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 um i'm thinking about literary things i just always come back to the wizard of oz and how much i love that movie from a comic book perspective this is also probably cheating but i've really enjoyed x-men gold at least what i have read of it because i really like um shadow cat and i really like kitty pride i haven't gotten very far the vo the look you're giving me makes me sound or makes me feel as if that's a dumb thing but um i really like shadow cat and that's just how i feel so those are my two things okay um I, I, I do like the, the character of Kitty Pride, and so I, I do think that that is a, a, that's definitely a good character. Uh, my my look has to do more with the, the specific writer, but um, we're not going to get into that because this is about being positive. This is not about being negative. So I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, you should definitely check out X-Men Blue, too, um, by Colin Bunn that's running at the same time. I think you'd enjoy that as well. But So, so for me, everyone's, everyone's probably seen this, but... It... It's a movie that I, I bought, and I bought not only because I loved it, but because I thought my daughter would love it, and she does. And it's a movie that has probably fallen into now my top three all-time comic book movies, and, and Maya's not going to agree with me on this, but I like think Patty like. Jenkins' Wonder Woman is is amazing. Like, I think it I think it's absolutely fantastic. And I'm going to... I'm not going to talk about some of the, like... like I would make the argument that No Man's Land is the the greatest action sequence in a comic book movie. Like I love it to death. But what what's more important to me is just who Wonder Woman is in that movie as a character and as someone who is filmed by a director. Um, the fact that she is a character that doesn't know our world, but she's not naive. Like. There's a scene on the boat where uh, Chris Pine asks her about sex or whatever, and she's like, I know what it is. Like, I'm not an idiot. I've written it. I just haven't experienced it. Like, she's not dumb needing someone to guide her. She's just new to this world. But yet she's capable and she's strong and she's able to overcome uh, the, the things that happen. And then to see that in contrast with Justice League, just how the movie is filmed, where... It is not filmed with the male gaze, to use a overused phrase maybe, but like she is filmed as just any other person that is in that movie. And then you watch her in Justice League and every shot is her ass. Every shot is built around framing Gal Gadot's ass into the shot as opposed to this is a character I'm treating as equal as any other male character that is in the movie. I absolutely love that movie. I think it is a phenomenal achievement. I think it's going to open the door. I honestly believe that the reason that Captain Marvel has a female director is because of what Patty Jenkins did in Wonder Woman. I don't think we get that without that. And I think we are now going to see... And I think you could almost say the same that we may not have gotten Ryan Coogler on Black Panther doing an African-American character if we don't have the success that is... Wonder Woman. I think that is a movie that broke down doors. It was a character I had no real feelings about going into it. It is a movie I didn't expect. Um, I, I know the problems with the, the final act of it, and I agree with a lot of the problems of the final act of it, but that movie is so good for so long and changed the way that we pick filmmakers in this genre that I don't think we can understate how important it is. Okay. Well, thank you. That those aren't exactly new suggestions, but I yeah, they're not, appreciate but... the comments nonetheless. I actually also too, I, I, I'm, I'm thankful because um, Maya saying Wizard of Oz, I never thought of it. That fact that okay, it's a female protagonist. It's also a female villain, um, and that the the male characters in it more or less are kind of bumbling, stumbling along for the ride. So that that actually it makes me kind of want to go see it again. Um, not that I'm... She is significantly stronger than any of the counterparts that she has in that movie. And even the the wizard 
in comparison is is basically when it comes down to it can tr portrayed as more bumbling and and dorothy has her flaws and she doesn't know the world she's in but she is significantly stronger than any of the male counterparts she runs up against and the witch is significantly stronger than any of her male counterparts and is as much as I enjoy Wicked and had a great time with Wicked, one of my my drawbacks to it is is I didn't like them making that the Wicked Witch of the West, um, a, like a scorn like a boy sick, scorned woman. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think that's a drawback to that character as a whole because she's too strong for that. Well, and all you need is for her to be house. pissed off because her somebody dropped the house on her fucking sister. Well, exactly. Like, and, <laughs> and and let me just be clear, go see Wicked because you'll have a really good time. But she is a better character as she is presented in The Wizard of Oz than she is in Wicked. That's interesting. I'm, I, I am going to go rewatch that movie now. Um, and 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 try and look at it that way. Yeah. When she, um, it, you know, like goes up in a in a flame ball uh when she basically the first time that she visits when she goes to like munchkin land or whatever and like kind of explodes the actress actually like was on fire at that point so there's lots of little cool easter eggs the more that you get into that movie that's you know as much as you guys it's talk pretty about amazing that, effects for the 30s yeah all yeah. around but that's that's my that's my gig that's my old time movie one of my all-time greats it's probably top three of my favorite movies so, speaking of top three, um, this has been a top three episode as far as length, and the three of us can all be found on the interwebs. Mark, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me at Wink Martindale 5 talking a bunch of shit to a lot of nerdy white guys who can't write comic books well. And you can find me at Luke underscore Nitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L, talking a lot of shit to Maya Madrid. And I'm at Maya Madrid still wondering what the author of X-Men Gold did. I think I'm going to ask that as soon as we cut. So uh, have a good week, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks for listening to Kids Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter at kidsseriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.